You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Freedom is all about choices. And while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xe, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 222. This week, a big thank you goes out to Eric for supporting this podcast on Patreon, where Eric now gets access to special ad-free versions of all of these episodes, plus special Patreon-only episodes released once a month. If that sounds interesting to you, head on over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar to find out more information. Also, a reminder that episode 231, so nine episodes from now, is going to be a listener questions episode. So if you have any questions about the war, the start of the war, the end of the war, the aftermath, any topic around the First World War, send it on over to historyofthegreatwar at outlook.com so I can get it down to that episode. Uh, we already have a good number of questions, but of course, there can always be more. Last episode, we discussed the British position in the Middle East before looking at the Egyptian Revolution of 1919, during which the people of Egypt revolted against British rule. This week, we are going to look at a similar event that would occur in the British-occupied areas of Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, in July 1920. Measured in combatant numbers, the Iraqi Revolt of 1920 was one of the largest that the British would experience in the 20th century. Estimates vary of how many people joined in the rebellion, with British estimates putting the number at over 130,000. While both the events in Egypt and Iraq would have some similarities, the largest difference would be the military nature of the uprising in Iraq. In Iraq, the British military and civilian leadership would be faced by large armed militias that were quickly formed and organized due to the same societal features that the British had used so effectively against the Ottomans during the First World War. In 1920, the British would find it no easier to deal with these militias than the Ottomans had. When facing such a large protest in an area where they were trying to grow and solidify their influence, the British really needed one consistent purpose and vision for how to proceed, and this was something that they simply did not have. There were many groups within the British government, and many of them had their own views on what the future of Mesopotamia should look like. In the India office, they wanted the strongest possible British control of the region, and for Mesopotamia to be declared a British protectorate. This protectorate would then be managed by the India office itself. The British Foreign Office wanted to create an Arab state, which would have some form of self-determination, but would be formulated so that the nation would always be very close to the British Empire. Both of these groups were then put under pressure from others within the British government, with the most pressing problem being one of finances. The British Empire had spent huge sums of money on the First World War, and the years after it were times of drastic budget cutting. In this new, more fiscally conscious atmosphere, the vast sums of money being poured into Mesopotamia in the forms of paying and supplying the British military presence was starting to draw criticism. The British military presence was led by Lieutenant General Haldane, who had formerly commanded an army corps on the Western Front. One thing to know about Haldane is that when he was assigned to the post in Mesopotamia, he basically knew nothing about Iraq and its situation. He also did not appear very willing to learn about that situation when he arrived in Baghdad on March 27, 1920. What he did know was that he had a job to do, and that job was to reduce the size of the military garrison in Iraq as quickly and efficiently as possible. These efforts to reduce the military footprint of the British Army was seen as critical due to all of the events that were happening elsewhere in the British Empire, and had really been happening since the beginning of 1919. 
1919 had been the year when the strain of the war had caused the British society to begin to crack. In January 1919, there had been a strike in Glasgow, uh, during which 35,000 industrial workers took to the street. Then in June 1919, there were strikes in Liverpool and elsewhere in the Midlands, and other strikes in other industrial areas continued throughout the year. There was a belief in London that there was a real possibility of a revolutionary strike in early 1920. In Ireland, the Republican government had met for the first time in Dublin, there was the revolt in Egypt that we talked about last episode, and then on top of all of these new events, the morale and discipline within the British army began to collapse. In the early months of 1919, there had been mutinies in various British units, all of them demanding immediate demobilization. These mutinies and protests would continue throughout the year, and this reduced the number of dependable troops that could be used both at home and around the world. All of these problems were then combined with economic issues, with serious crises developing in industrial areas and industries like coal mining and manufacturing. And then there was also large debt payments due to be paid to the United States. Within the framework of these problems, the Mesopotamian occupation seemed like a bottomless pit of resources that the British government could ill afford. Churchill, who was Secretary of State for War at this stage, was intensely critical of the situation in the Middle East. In total, there were over 84,000 British and Indian troops in the theater, with most of those being stationed in Mesopotamia. Along with these forces were a large number of civilian leaders, families, and administrators. In total, the occupation of Mesopotamia was costing £18 million per year. This set up Mesopotamia to be an area where three different groups of leaders all saw the situation differently, and they all had different opinions about the best path forward. There were leaders in London, like Churchill, who just wanted to bring costs down. There were military leaders in Baghdad, led by Wilson, who believed that they were fully capable of handling things, and it was in fact the military's fault that so much money was being spent in the region. To try and prove that not only could the civil administration stand on its own, but that it could also be a financial benefit to the British taxpayer, Wilson put in place taxes on local people and commerce. The justification was that since the local people were benefiting from British leadership, they should have to pay for it. And this payment could be in the form of money, if they had it, or in the form of labor provided by the people. The region had a long history of labor as a form of payment of taxes to the government, with the Ottoman authorities often calling upon local tribal leaders to organize laborers for various projects. However, they had always been careful to ensure that the local leaders believed that whatever was being worked on was a benefit to them. This helped assure continued support from those tribal leaders, even if their followers were less than enthusiastic. The British continued to demand the labor as a form of taxation. The problem was that it was a bit questionable if the work that they were doing was an actual benefit to the local society. This caused resentment not just among the people doing the work, but also from those local leaders who were starting to get organized. While the British were disorganized, in Iraq, resistance against British influence was growing and was becoming itself quite organized. The growing dislike of British rule began to solidify during the later months of 1919, when it became clear that even though the war was over, the British were not going to quickly leave or relinquish their control. This caused Shia and Sunni leaders to come together to plan for what a joint future might look like if the British, you know, could be removed. These plans were fluid, but probably would have revolved around a Sunni emir and a popular assembly that almost certainly would have been dominated by the more populous Shias. Along with a basic outline of this plan, the growing Arab independence movement began to coalesce around a handful of Arab statesmen that provided the movement great central control and structure. A critical part of this growing movement was played by the mosques around Baghdad, When they started their occupation, the British had outlawed political meetings and rallies. However, given the position of Islam among the populace, they did not, and they really felt that they could not, do anything to hinder religious gatherings. This allowed the Arab leaders to use mosques and other religious areas as a place to meet and discuss their plans without having to worry about British interference. While most of these discussions revolved around local events and plans, there were also areas where news of events around the world were discussed. At the time, some of the most influential news came out of Anatolia and the campaigns of Turkish nationalists against British and Greek influence. There were many animosities between the Arabs and the Turks, but this did begin to diminish after the war, and especially after Mustafa Kemal grew in power with his very limited view of Turkish expansion.
The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Freedom is all about choices, and while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xE. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xE, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. The British authorities, while often not knowing the details, did at least have some information about what was happening among the Arab leaders. These developments were viewed with some concern, but this concern was taken to a new level in January 1920, when the first reports were made by British police about a pamphlet circling around Baghdad. This pamphlet was created by Muhammad Bartatullah, who, and it was named Bolshevism and Islam. Within the pamphlet, Barkatullah would advocate for Arab nationalists to move towards a policy that combined many ideas of communism, Islam, and Arab nationalism. Overall support for this mixture of ideas was never very strong, and certainly it was not strong enough to have a decisive influence on the movement as a whole, but just the fact that such, quote, Bolshevik talk was seriously discussed in Baghdad greatly concerned British officials. This was a period of great social unrest in many areas of Europe, including in Britain. Uh, so remember, this is early 1920s, so the Russian Civil War is still ongoing. The Bolsheviks are still talking about a worldwide revolution. Events in Germany are still very much in flux. So this was a time of just great concern about a Bolshevik revolution spreading around the world, and including spreading into the Middle East, which brought it one step closer to India, which absolutely terrified British leaders. The important thing to remember about all of these thoughts and theories, the Bolshevism, the Arab leaders, anybody, was that no matter what their differences were, especially when it came to political outlook for the future, the first step was always the same, remove the British. It was only after the British yoke was removed that the future of Mesopotamia could be controlled by the people who lived there, and that was their goal. The string of events that would directly lead to the revolt in July began in May 1920, with a large demonstration in Baghdad that began on the 26th. On that day, large groups of protesters moved around the city chanting anti-British and pro-independence slogans. The situation was ripe for escalation, and that escalation would be provided by the military governor of the city, Colonel Frank Balfour. He made the decision to send armored cars into the streets, and this act was intended to be a simple show of force, proving that the British were still in control. However, almost immediately, the protesters began to throw stones at the cars and the surrounding British buildings. Fighting then broke out, and a few protesters were injured, with a blind man being run over and killed by one of the armored cars. With the protest in serious danger of spiraling completely out of control, Civil Commissioner Arnold Wilson stepped in to try and find a political solution. He agreed to a meeting with 15 nationalist leaders on June 2nd at the headquarters of the British Civil Administration. At this meeting, it was expected that the Arab leaders would present their demands and maybe some form of negotiation would take place. Wilson had a plan to reduce the influence of these 15 leaders, and using the excuse that they did not represent the views of all of the people in the city, 
he also invited 40 other leaders from the community. These 40 leaders were pro-British and were handpicked by the British administration to be used as a way of controlling the more radical leaders. There was just one problem with this plan. Only nine of them would actually appear at the meeting. The rest would find excuses not to be there. With his plan to pack the vote of failure, Wilson still continued with the meeting. He began with a lengthy speech in English, with a translation provided by British Administrator Gertrude Bell. Here is a small piece of that speech. Quote, I can assure you that those individuals in Baghdad who have sought from patriotic or other motives to hasten the establishment of a civil government here by incitements to violence and by rousing the passions of ignorant men are doing and indeed have already done a great disservice to the country. Those who are encouraging disorder and inciting men against the existing regime are arousing forces which the present administration can and will control. It is my duty as the temporary head of the civil administration to warn you that any further incitements of violence and any further appeals to prejudice will be met with a, by a vigorous action both from the military authorities and the civil administration. End quote. The entire speech was designed to make it clear that any future disorders would be met by a strong British response and to cow the Arab leaders into submission due to fear of that possible response. After Wilson's speech was over, the oldest Arab representative, Yusuf Suwadi, uh, presented the demands of the British leaders. And here is an English translation as written by Bell. Quote, Firstly, we demand the immediate establishment of a convention representing the Iraqi people, which will lay out the route whereby the form of government and its foreign relations will be determined. Secondly, the granting of freedom of the press so that the people may express their desires and belief. And thirdly, the removal of all restrictions on the postal and telegraph services, both between different parts of the country and between Iraq and neighboring countries and kingdoms, to enable the people to confer with each other and to understand current world political developments. After these demands were presented, Wilson made it clear that he could not make any actual decisions, and instead he had to forward all the information to London and then wait for a reply. This put a delay on any actual changes, and was a classic delaying tactic. After the meeting in late May, Wilson continued to work against the Arabs who were pushing for independence. He made it clear several times that if they continued to agitate for change, then the British military would take action. The Arab leaders would ignore these warnings, and therefore Wilson would start to make plans with military leaders to arrest many of those who were termed extremists. Wilson contemplated ordering the arrest on June 16th, but he was advised to reconsider these actions by the British Judicial Secretary. The Secretary's concerns were based around fears that if the arrests were made, violence would erupt, violence that the British may not be able to control. Up until this point, around mid-June 1920, Wilson and other British leaders had been very focused on events in the capital. However, resistance to British rule was also building up in the more rural regions around the country. All throughout the countryside, demonstrations were occasionally held, and one of these would occur in the village of Karbela, roughly 100 kilometers southwest of Baghdad. The local British commander, Major Pulley, was concerned about the demonstrations, which he believed had the possibility of turning into something more. He had good reason to believe that this might be the case, because it was led by one of the sons of Grand Mujtahid Shirazi. Shirazi was the leader of Islamic thought in the country, and he, what he said really mattered and he was calling for an uprising. Pulley ordered British troops into the area and they surrounded the village. Pulley then sent an invitation to local leaders to come to a conference to discuss the events and to try and defuse tensions. In attendance to this conference would be one of the sons of Shirazi. The conference would take place on June 22nd, and as soon as they arrived, 11 of the Arab representatives were arrested and sent to a British prison. This action caused tensions to rise almost immediately, and soon Pulley was communicating with Shirazi. Shirazi made it clear that if Pulley did not release the prisoners, then it was very likely that violence would begin. He put the cause of this violence squarely on the shoulders of the British for their actions and the actions that they were taking. Pulley was at first determined not to release them, but eventually he would be convinced. However, instead of just releasing the prisoners as Shirazi requested, he exiled them to Persia. When news of this action reached Sirazi, he took a fateful step. He released a fatwa, which, when translated, read, It is the duty of the Iraqis to demand their rights. In demanding them, they should maintain peace and order. 
But if the English prevent them from obtaining their rights, it is permitted to make use of defensive force. End quote. This seems pretty unambiguous, and it was. Sarazi had just given the Iraqis religious permission for their fighting, and it would not be long before they would act on it. It would begin in the small village of Rumaitha, 250 kilometers south of Baghdad, and it would begin small. But over the course of the next month, it would spread, with over 100,000 insurgents eventually taking up arms all along the Euphrates. The Iraqi revolt had begun, and it would change the future of Iraq and the Middle East. 